Hi, I'm Sean Taylor, and thank you for tuning in for another episode of Hustle, Play, Love. By now, most of us are familiar with the story of how Issa Rae, creator of the hit series Insecure on HBO and a growing list of film credits, got her big Hollywood break by creating her own web series called Awkward Black Girl. She drew millions of viewers and Hollywood finally took notice. Today, there is a burgeoning community of content creators that are changing what and how we watch scripted and unscripted series and films. Some of these actors and writers and producers have found success right here in Chicago. My next guest is one of them. Troy Pryor is an actor and producer who's on stage, on camera, and voiceover work has led to award-winning content, including collaborations with ABC, HGTV, Warner Brothers, TV One, and Aspire TV. Troy is an advocate for connecting local, undiscovered diverse talent to mainstream content and media platforms through his production network, Creative Cypher. Last year, he acquired the Southside Black Film Festival and rebranded it XL Film Fest. He's also the youngest person ever to be elected to Chicago Screen Actors Guild and the sag after Board of Directors. I could go on about this man, but instead I'll let you meet him. <laughs> hey, Troy, thank you for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Wow. So we've been on a bit of a journey. I met you back at Sundance Film Festival in 2016, yes. and you've made so many strides here in Chicago six, since then. You know, I wonder what tea leaves were you reading that made you, first of all, want to start an organization like Creative Cypher to aggregate all these resources for cinematic talent here in Chicago? Well, you know, for me, it actually started before I got into entertainment. Mm -hmm. So I came from a family full of clergy and community leaders. So there were some soft skills, some transferable things that I was able to access when I became uh, a talent. Mm -hmm. And I, I was on set and I would talk to everybody from craft services to the director. And eventually uh, I was able to connect a lot of dots because I was raised from community leaders. And I remember one day I was staring at my phone waiting for a call back for a hit television show. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, this can't be it. I can't, I can't just be sitting here waiting for my phone to ring uh, when I have this ability to bring people together mm -hmm. and create my own opportunities and aggregate resources. And it was somewhat of that light bulb moment. Like, if you don't make this move, you will always be waiting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know we know, I mentioned Issa Rae in the opening, but while Issa was doing that, there were a lot of other people doing the same thing around the same time, creating their own films, creating their own web series. Um, how do they do it? I mean, where do you get the funding to do this kind of work without Hollywood's backing? Well, that's a great point. When I got elected to uh, sag after mm -hmm. board of directors, I then co-chaired New Media, what was called New Media. And that was anything mm -hmm. that wasn't traditional uh, media. So that was... The, the YouTube and the web series and all of that. So Adventures of Awkward Black Girl that she put together, Issa put together was a great benchmark. And so all of these creators, some that were already in front of the camera that mm -hmm. had that same revelation that let's create our own stuff. Uh, the idea that sh the costs were not as prohibitive, you could pick up your cell phone and create something. You can get some equipment that would have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars some time ago uh, that now you have access to was a game changer. But the biggest thing was things like YouTube, mm -hmm. social media, the mm -hmm. distribution changed a lot of it because so many stars that we consider stars now came about because they just put themselves out there. Now, realistically, you still need quality control because yeah. it's the gift and the curse, right? To yeah. have that uh, ability to distribute your work. Uh, but that tool became a huge component for a lot of creators that otherwise would have never been seen. So are we seeing more um, stories like Issa's or, we, or is that still kind of in the, is she still kind of, you know, um, the unicorn uh, when it comes to as big as she's gotten from a web series? Or do we expect to see more of this happening, more, more stars grow out of this um, content creating environment? Well, that's a, a bit of a loaded question because even the, <laughs> the idea of a star has changed now. Okay. You know, the concept of a star uh, was was more relevant when we didn't have as much access into the lives of everyone. There was some there was mm. some mystery around it. Now it's you kind of know everything about everybody at some at yeah, some point. Yeah, sometimes unfortunately. Unfortunately, we do. <laughs> yeah. So that stardom, the the what makes that individual special mm. has fizzled just a little bit. Um, you know, uh, unless you're talking about folks that are, that have already had that 
that space. Uh, I will say there will be more creators, uh, and a lot of that is going to not only boil down to what we just discussed, but also uh, for individuals, especially individuals of color that have gotten in roles or positions where they can, where they can support and finance content creation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's Issa, but it's also what Issa did with her company, Color Creative, and how she was able to then open doors for others. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. more individuals that get in positions like that, which is what we focus on in Creative Cypher, is how do you empower more executives, uh, how do you empower more creators of color to own their IP? Mm. It opens the doors for others. For other people. Um, I want to switch over um, for, to the XL Film Festival. You put on your first festival here last year. It was a huge success. Um, RogerEber.com said the XL Film Festival arrives at a perilous time in the entertainment industry. Of course, right then at the time, writers and actors were still on strike. So how does a film fest here in Chicago change the Hollywood landscape? Well, it, it creates a platform for a lot of creators that felt as though they needed to move and relocate. And it's very similar mm. to this idea of uh, the Internet democratizing things mm. or having mm -hmm. access to resources, democratizing the, the game. 2020, for a lot of unfortunate reasons, woke a lot of people up mm -hmm. as well about waiting for opportunities or looking at systems and infrastructures mm -hmm. and how you can do things in other ways. So a festival is a great opportunity to celebrate those creators, but it's also an experiential moment because in our, in our um in our journey, it's allowed us to generate revenue through advertising and sponsorships that can be reallocated into financing content. Chicago's ah, always okay. had great talent. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you have like I came out of Second City, like all of like all my friends, like they we've always had great talent. The challenge has been has there been an infrastructure to retain, and so you oftentimes see people relocate, and you find out. 10, 15 years later, like, oh, they're from Chicago? They're from Chicago. They're from Chicago. Yeah. Like, yeah, they mm -hmm. moved. But the talent was always there. Mm -hmm. So a festival not only highlights the creators that are here, it helps retain, but in our experience, it's attracted so many folks that you would easily look at and say they've made it, they're from Chicago, and I'll get a call like, what do you need? How can I come back and help? Okay. Three days after my festival, I was starting to get contacted by folks that are like, I wish that was around 20 years ago. Mm. And there's mm -hmm. a whole other cultural component to it as well because we've got some amazing festivals here. Uh, but this is actually the first time where it's 100% black owned. It has a, last year was Hip Hop 50. Mm -hmm. So it had an element to it that yeah. was not only commercially viable, because hip hop moves a lot in the in the commercial space, mm -hmm. but it attracts a lot of influencers and tastemakers, which gives you access to dollars that Absolutely. You, can, you can leverage. So um, I want to hear about your new collaboration and your new film project that's coming out. Tell us about it. Appreciate that. So Creative Cypher as a whole is moving into more of a parent company mm. role. We celebrate our 10th year this year, and now we have four major verticals. Uh, one of those verticals is our production division, and we have a joint venture called Darkberry uh, Productions. Oh, great Dark name. <laughs> <laughs> Darkberry, actually, uh, we started filming the first project during the pandemic. Okay. It's called Long Division that premieres uh, this Friday. Uh, theatrically at the Davis Theater, and then it goes on Roku that now give night. give us the date, because our show is taped in advance. So what date is that going to be so happening? So it premieres uh, January 19th Okay. Uh, uh, at the Davis Theater in Chicago. And then right after that theatrical premiere, you can watch it on Roku as well, uh, starring Barry Brewer from BET's Bra and Brandy Denise from BET as well. And so that's the first property underneath the Dark Barry Productions umbrella, which is okay. the new, which is one of our new joint So give ventures. me the log line. What's the log line for the film? What's the film about? <laughs> oh, the film is actually about a couple that's going through a divorce and they're forced to stay in the house together because Ooh. of COVID. And it's you're oh. following their journey. I love the way you just kind of blended that right into the theme of my show. I like that. <laughs> um, so when is the XL Film Festival going to be held this year? Yeah, so the XL Festival is going to be August 15th through the 18th uh, here in Chicago. It's in the High Park, Har Harper Court area. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority of the uh, events will be in the Polsky Center, but we're now activating multiple locations in that Harper area with some amazing partners. So we're really oh, excited about this. That's great. I, I love everything up and down that corridor. If I have a film, the ones I want to be, you know, to screen, like, what do I do? How do I learn more about how to participate? So uh, open submissions will start in March. 
Okay. So you can go to creativecipher.org mm -hmm. and you'll see a window pop up for submissions for that. You can also go to filmfreeway.com when that opens up mm -hmm. and submissions will be available if you're a filmmaker and you want to submit to the festival. But one more thing I want to ask you before you go, and I just want to see if you can kind of give us a little bit of inside baseball and what the whole strike was like and how that ended up. Do, are, are actors and writers, are they happy right now with how that all came together? Or, or some people still feel like they're going to be left out? For the most part, yeah. I mean, we, for, for the answer to your question, <laughs> yes. So it was a historic negotiation mm -hmm. that took place. Yeah. And so it's moving in a, a better direction. A lot of it stemmed from what is possible in the future if you don't have some type of checks and balances now, meaning with what does AI do in five uh, years AI, if yeah. you don't have some parameters put in place now. And so that was a huge component because as a creator, at the end of the day, your IP is your goal. Mm -hmm. And if, if your own image and likeness, not just what you create, is now taken advantage of or can be used in perpetuity, like there were things that yeah. were being suggested uh, that were being proposed where I can take a scan of you, studio can take a scan of you mm -hmm. and use it in perpetuity and in a variety of ways. Yeah, that's, and that's a that's lot. That's a terrifying thought. Mm -hmm. well, well, Troy, thank you so much. Um, you. Continued success to you. Um, I know you're going to go on to do great things. Um, um, you can learn more about the XL Film Festival online at creativecipher.org. Creativecipher.org. We'll be right back to check in on Chicago's theater scene. Don't go away. On the next Chicago Newsroom 2.0, Mass Exodus, what's behind the increasing number of companies moving their headquarters out of the city? We'll unpack the issue with Block Club Chicago's Jamie Nesbitt-Golden and Emmy Award-winning journalist Samantha Thomas. Join the conversation Wednesday at 7 p.m. on CAN-TV Cable Channel 19 or stream live on CAN-TV.org or on the CAN-TV Plus app. Experience the power of community television. We're back, and I'm so excited about this next segment. During the pandemic, one of the things I missed the most was theater and the performing arts. Theater productions all but ceased at the height of COVID-19, and some beloved theaters even closed permanently. So has theater recovered? And what do Chicago theater goers have to look forward to in 2024? If anybody can answer those questions, mm -hmm. it's my next two guests. Mm -hmm. Jackie Taylor, director, producer, actress, educator, singer, playwright, and the founder of Chicago's legendary Black Ensemble Theater joins us. Jackie, I am so delighted that you're here. Mm -hmm. The Black Ensemble Theater is recognized for its outstanding original productions and educational programs and has maintained a stage for black creative expression for 47 years. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And we have the longtime theater critic for the Chicago Tribune, who I dare say has become something of a legend <laughs> himself. Chris Jones has published thousands of reviews of Chicago and Broadway shows and enterprise articles about theater for the Chicago Tribune and the New York Daily News for over 20 years. Chris, so glad that you're here. Very glad to be and here. And I can tell this is a winning combination. <laughs> right, these two. Of course. We love each other. <laughs> All right, no karate in the studio. <laughs> so, I mean, I, one of the main things I wanted just to know, because I see what's going on in Chicago. It looks like there's a new show rolling out every five minutes. So I want to ask you both, and I'm start with you, Chris, on this yeah. one. Has the, has the Chicago theater scene really made a comeback since COVID? Well, uh, I would say not fully, mm -hmm. but it has come a long way, particularly in the last three months, okay. I would say. Now, I think there's, there are fewer shows, and I think that if, if I'm telling the truth, I have to say that, you know, there, there are fewer shows this January than there have been in any January of the last 20 years. So hmm. that tells you, I think, that theaters were nervous about coming back to full production, mm -hmm. that uh, some of them have sort of took the holiday off a little bit. And I think, obviously, as you pointed out in your intro, some of those companies are no longer here. Yeah. And uh, I think we've found that the strong companies in the city, including Black Ensemble, 
have been doing well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we found that some of the companies that were sort of struggling before COVID, you know, have just not, not reemerged. And so I'm a bit preoccupied, I guess, with trying to get the level of production in Chicago back up a little to a little bit more because I feel mm -hmm. a bit like, like right now, if you were to say, what, what can I see tonight? There's not as much as this city has traditionally offered to its theater goers. So compared to 2023, fewer shows this year. So do you think? Well, I'm, I'm comparing no. it more to sort of right before the right pandemic. Before the, oh, right before the yeah, pandemic. Yeah, right before okay. the pandemic. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we still just haven't ramped back up yeah, um, quite yet. Yeah, that's what I would say. So, um, so, I mean, Chicago, you know, where do we stand, you know, in terms of creeping up on Broadway, New York? I mean, we were kind of on our way and then COVID struck. And yeah. so I guess, you know, that's still kind of a little bit of a kind of a bit of a standstill right now. Well, I think that the, the New York has recovered a bit more quickly because obviously the theater in New York on Broadway is very dependent on tourism. Mm, and, uh, mm -hmm. and I think this year you began to see people go back to New York as tourists. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the... the the, the scene there has recovered more quickly, but still not fully back either. Okay. Like, you know, right now, for example, Harmony, which is a new musical, just announced it's closing today. Mm -hmm. uh, Shocked, which is a very fun show, also has announced it's closing. So Broadway is not immune to these forces, I mm -hmm. think. Um, but I do feel optimistic that it's so much better than it was say six or eight months ago yeah, in Chicago. So much. And I think that's a good thing. But I think the city's got to pay more attention to the theater community. That's exactly. It's got to realize the asset that it has in all of these theaters. It's why people choose to yeah, live here. And that's why I wanted to have you on today. <laughs> so, I mean, Jackie, it sounds like though Black Ensemble Theater is kind of experienced a little bit of the opposite. I mean, your shows have been extended. You've been extending shows. And you're also in the middle of an expansion. I w want to learn a little bit more about those plants. Sure. Uh, you know, theater is a, in itself a very fragile business mm -hmm. to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not surprised at all at our industry and how we are recuperating. Mm -hmm. uh, black Ensemble Theater is a different kind of theater. We have... Uh, we do things a little bit differently than the norm. Mm -hmm. And we were uh, fortunate enough to be recognized by Mackenzie Scott. And during the time of COVID, we received a very much needed influx of cash. Mm. And that definitely helped us to survive. Uh, Bravo. Be, yeah, so we we are very fortunate in that. And that gave us the foundation that helped us to continue to build. We were never dependent on subscriptions, okay. which, is, which a lot of theaters do believe in. Mm, That's mm -hmm. just not my belief. Mm. I, I have a different formula. Mm -hmm. So... And it's working. So yes. Maybe some of these <laughs> larger theaters ought to start looking at how you're doing that. Uh, uh, so not having a, a subscription base mm -hmm. was fundamental in terms of allowing us to survive. So more than survive, you're thriving. So you're expanding. Yes. T t tell me about that. Uh, we're building a neighborhood development called Free to Be. And the purpose of it is to continue our mission expand our mission of eradicating racism outside of the theater walls so that we're building a community that reflects a national image of what diversity and inclusion can be. We're building a performing arts education center. We're building oh, a uh, film technology center, uh, affordable housing for artists. And oh, wow. uh, uh, we're fantastic. building businesses uh, that will help to perpetuate our mission and provide the economics that the theater needs to survive for the next hundred years. I love it. That sounds phenomenal. When, yes. when are plans expected to be completed? We, it's a five-year journey, mm -hmm. and uh, we basically are in our, we've, we, we've bought all the property, and, and some uh, of it's up around the theater too, right? Well, it's, it's right across the street. Right across, okay, right, right. across the street. So That's we, awesome. Yeah, we, we, we bought all the property. We have hired the architects. It, the design is 
not finished yet because you know we have to get that community input and community approval mm -hmm. but uh, we're well on our way that's great. I'm glad to hear there's more educational facilities being built yes. um, because, of course, those facilities also shut down during COVID. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, Chris, are we seeing you know more people kind of go back into theaters to learn? Um, is that picking well, up Well, I think you, you make a great point about arts education. So one of, I think one of the big problems that occurred in COVID was that the school groups Mm. that would go to theaters effectively stop going. Now, the, obviously there were good reasons for that, but once the schools reopened, the, the field trips to theaters did not return with the reopening of the schools because mm. I think frankly, you know, schools had to readjust to the new reality mm -hmm. and, the, and it took a while to get, you know, to get all that m moving again. And I still feel that I in Chicago, too many kids are not getting a lot of arts education. And I think that, you know, it's a little bit like if you go to the Chicago Symphony Orchestra and, and you look at the audience, most of the people in the audience at the CSO studied music in school or at least had a music appreciation class or learned as a kid mm -hmm. how to really appreciate uh, the arts. And I think one of the things, you know, you don't just land at Black Ensemble. In many ways, you learn about it when you're young. Yeah. And maybe a parent takes you or a grandparent takes you or you, you begin to becomes integrated into your life. And I think that, that that arts education piece is something that needs a lot more attention in this city. Oh, yeah. So it's kind of like the new normal hasn't ramped that back up yet. No, We've got to break, no. break out of that. No, I mean, and I'm sitting here because of what happened to me when I was 12 or 13 years old when someone took me to the theater and Absolutely. I started going as a teenager. Mm -hmm. I would go and take my dates to the theater. I, 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 when I was 14, 15, 16, I was going to the theater and now here I am still going. Still going to but the I, theater. But I yeah. don't think I would be here now if I'd not sort of had, you know, if I'd not had that in my school, which I had a very good arts education program in my mm -hmm. school and that made all the difference for me and that's a big, big factor when we're talking about where's the audience or is the audience coming back, we've got to get folks while they're young mm -hmm. and, and we've got to prioritize arts education, I think. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the arts have <coughs> been slashed uh, immensely when uh, the educational industry decided that they needed to um, downsize, the mm -hmm. first thing to go was arts. is the arts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people understand the vital importance of the arts. All children do not learn the same. We true. have some very creative human beings mm -hmm. that need to learn differently. And the arts support all your learning facilities. Mm -hmm. It helps you to focus, it helps you to listen, it helps you to concentrate, it builds your confidence, mm -hmm. your self-esteem. It does so much for you. Yeah, it's a great outlet, yes. especially when you hear about young people, you know, dealing with a lot of um, mental stress and right. certainly following COVID-19, you know, being able to spend some time, you know, working on some music or uh, dance, or but all that's out of schools. But it is here locally, you just gotta either be able to afford to go, are there m more grant opportunities to help send people to some well, of these programs? Well, you know, Black Ensemble Theater has a huge arts education function mm -hmm. because I'm a former teacher from the Chicago Public Schools. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> of course, mm -hmm. uh, I've embedded within Black Ensemble Theater the kind of programs that help me be successful in the inner city as a teacher. So. It's, it's, I, I think it's a form of education and for people understanding that when you, when you take the arts away, you're, you're taking away a vital, vital form of education yeah. that needs to exist in order for our kids to survive. Yeah, and, and, and to thrive and be healthy. Um, theaters are businesses, as we know, and um, businesses, can come across staffing shortages or labor issues, as we just saw Second City teachers right. just averted a strike mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Um, so Chris, should we brace for more potential disruptions like this to the Ch to Ch Chicago theater scene? Well, I, you know, I think there's an interesting issue is that people of a certain age, as on, on this couch, uh, <laughs> come from a culture <laughs> of the <laughs> theater, a culture <laughs> of the theater where a lot of people did it for the love 
or or understood that they wouldn't make more money or did it as a kind of side hustle. Mm. And I think you're finding that the younger generation, for good reason, mm -hmm. is re rejecting really a lot of the a lot of those old ways of thinking about the theater and they are expecting to be you know more fairly compensated and i think if you look at a theater like second city mm -hmm. you know it's owned by a venture capitalist company there's there's money there they recognize that uh and historically it's made money so i think you know some level of union activity at those for-profit theaters is not too surprising yeah it can go too far in my opinion i mean i think if you look at now you know, say for example, uh, Steppenwolf Theatre has a very now heavily unionized uh, front of house staff, for example, mm, and that mm -hmm. I think has, has been tricky for them because they've been struggling in the aftermath of the pandemic. Yeah. But I think that, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think that theatre has long been a unionized industry and it's been the only way that artists who don't have regular jobs, in many cases, they go from project to project, they have to have protections. And so I've always been a huge supporter of the unions in the theater. I think they're an essential part of the theater. Mm -hmm. So it, it's about people have to be reasonable, but people have to always, you know, they have to fairly compensate the employees that they value. Exactly. Um, so what's coming up at Black Ensemble? Oh. What do we have to look All forward right. to? All right, we have a full season. <laughs> we have, yeah, yeah. We're gonna start in February with yeah. uh, Daryl Brooks production of uh, the 80s, the time, the, the, what's the, the, the music, uh, the saw, time machine. Yes, I'm going to get my blue eyeshadow out <laughs> just for that. <laughs> and that's our first production, and it's already selling like, like hot cakes. Cause that's awesome. That's my era. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that yes, your era? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> there, there you go. So we're going to look up and see Chris. <laughs> yeah, the I'll audience. be there dancing in there. So I'll, Chris, what do you recommend right now? What's uh, hot? Well, there's a, uh, on the Broadway side, you've got obviously Hamilton still playing for a couple more weeks. And if you've never seen it, never met anyone who has never seen it, who went to see it, who regretted it. So I would I've recommend never that seen for sure. It. I think uh, Girl from the North Country, which is mm. a Bob Dylan jukebox musical, which sounds strange, but it's really huh, it's, but it's a good thing. Uh, I'm going to see Anything Goes tomorrow night at Porchlight Theatre. I'm looking forward to that. There's a great new production, I think, will be great anyway, of The Band's Visit uh, up in Glencoe at Riders Theatre. That should be fun. There's a new Brandon Jacob Jenkins play coming to Steppenwolf. That should be good. The actress Dana Delaney, who was on Desperate Housewives. I remember her, yeah. Yeah. So she, this is a weird project, but there's a new project to The Goodman starring her, written in part by her, all about her, it was real, really true story, her online relationship on Twitter with a fan who did not turn out to be what he purported to be. Oh, that and sounds kind of spooky. So I did a whole interview with her. She wouldn't say what it was. Of course, because you got to go see it. You got to go see it. <laughs> well, listen, thank you both for joining me. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion. We will be back after the break. I'm Hugo Valta, host of the program, Three Questions With. Nationwide, Latinos are 19% of the U.S. population, yet their presence in healthcare, particularly as physicians, remains disproportionately low. A lot of people think that achieving education is expensive, and that's true, but there's ways to get around that, like applying for scholarships. Join us on Wednesdays at 7.30 in the evening via Channel 19, streaming on CanTV.org and the Can TV Plus app. Thank you for joining me tonight. And special thanks to my guests, Troy Pryor, Chris Jones, and the incomparable Jackie Taylor. <laughs> I do hope you'll come back next week for an all new episode of Hustle Play Love. In the meantime, go ahead and rewatch the show at your convenience on demand at cantv.org or download the CanTV Plus app. Until next time, stay on your hustle, play like you mean it, and love like there's no tomorrow. I'm Sean Taylor, good night.